Amen. Amen. So I want you to look down at, uh, starting in verse 20. Woe unto them, they call evil good, and good evil, and put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty, to drink wine, and men of strength, to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous for him. Therefore, as fire devoureth stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their bosom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for this opportunity to preach, Lord. I pray that I would edify your church. Lord, use me in spite of me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, today is actually a pretty momentous occasion. Today is the 75th anniversary of a pretty famous day. Uh, you might know what it is. June 6th of 1944 is D-Day. And D-Day was the culminate, or I should say, the, the start, I shouldn't say the start, is, it's about the midpoint of World War II. That's when, that's when we actually landed in Europe. You know, on that day, 156,000 American, British, and Canadian troops landed on the beaches of Normandy in the largest amphibious operation in the history of the world. These men believed that they were fighting a righteous cause to rid the world of evil when in fact they were pawns in a senseless war yep. that killed more than 70 million people and set the political stage to kill 100 million more in a war that should have ended in 1940. But for the lust of one man's power and greed, he kept the war going. The title of my sermon tonight is Winston Churchill is Burning in Hell. Winston Churchill is Burning in Hell. And... You know, in this passage, we see right here in verse 20, it says, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, and put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. And you know, the reason why I'm preaching this is that I can go into any Baptist church, and I can say, you know what? Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a wicked man who was an absolute fool, ungodly fool, and they'd say Amen. All right? No one has any sympathy for Franklin Roosevelt. All right? I can go in there and I can say, hey, Joseph Stalin was a murderer, a mass murderer reprobate who killed millions of people. And you know what? Those men were allied. And they would say, you know what? You're right. But if I walk into a Baptist church today and I say, Winston Churchill's burning in hell because he's a mass murderer, they would say, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, I quote him from the pulpit. Yeah, they do. I've heard Winston Churchill quoted from the pulpit in churches more than any. I mean, I can't tell you how many times. But when you actually look at the guy's life and his history and what he did, he is responsible for millions of deaths. And, and you know, I'm going to go through and I'm going to show you some of the stuff that he did. But I want, I want you to know the big reason why I'm doing this is because there is a there is a sacred cow among churches and Baptists. Right. If I go into a Baptist church and I say, World War I was a senseless war that never should have been fought, they'd say, yeah, you're right. If I say Vietnam War was a senseless war that should have never been fought, they'd be like, yeah, you're probably right. If I say World War II was a senseless war that never should have been fought, whoa, yeah, yeah. wait a minute, that's the just war. Right. That's the war that we can excuse. Right. Well, what are they doing? What are they doing? Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness because that's exactly what they do. They justify the wicked for reward. You'll see in these churches all across America, oh, oh yeah, we're, we're having the color guard come in. We're celebrating the military. You know what? The Bible makes it perfectly clear that any war at all, unless it's a war of actual defense. They are putting their feet on our soil and I've got to fight for my, for my house and my nation. It's not a just war. Right. Yeah. And so this is this sacred cow in churches that, that I want to slaughter. 
Go to Romans chapter 1. The first thing we have to understand, especially about men like this, and I mean, I, I, want, I want to put a little caveat here because I'm going to say some things tonight that actually kind of make, it, make people seem that maybe I, I think that the Germans were good people or I think Adolf Hitler was a good person. I don't. He was a wicked reprobate. Every single person was involved in that war is guilty of mass murder, okay? But when I point something out in history that, that shows that the Germans weren't willing to do something that the British did without even thinking about it, it doesn't mean I'm siding with the Germans. It means I'm telling you that on that specific thing, they weren't even doing that. So... You're, go to Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, it, 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 gives, us, it gives us, you know, a, a really, it lays bare what a reprobate is. And if you don't know what a reprobate is, it's someone who's rejected by God. If you look back in the Old Testament, you'll find this with Pharaoh. Pharaoh was rejected by God. Pharaoh rejected God over and over and over again. And finally, God just said, I'm rejecting you. You can't get saved. Okay? And so God gives us a list and he actually tells us what reprobates are full of, and I want to show you that Winston Churchill was full of pretty much all these things. Starting in verse 29, it says, being filled, I want to highlight this, with all unrighteousness. Not a little bit, not some, all unrighteousness. Fornication, wickedness, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, Debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud. He was definitely proud. Boasters. He was a big boaster. Inventors of evil things. And you know what? He invented some things that are so evil, I, I even hesitate to talk about them. Disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and unmerciful. And you know, Winston Churchill fits the bill for quite a few of these. Now, I mean, obviously, your average unsaved person could have one or two or three of these things. I mean, disobedient to parents, you know, they're covenant breakers. But you know what? God's saying that these reprobates, these people that are rejected, have all of these qualities. And so we're going to see the, these qualities in his life. First off, I want to talk about war. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In Romans chapter 12, verse 18, it says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Amen. It doesn't say live peaceably with some men, unless they're Hitler. It says live peaceably with all men. So we should always be striving to live peaceably. And I think one of the problems that we have is that we believe the garbage that's force-fed us by the government by Hollywood, by the school system, where we get a twisted perspective of what's really gone on in the world as far as history goes. And we need to make sure that we are always going back to the Bible and seeing what the Bible says rather than some professor somewhere. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Look, look what it says. We walk in the flesh. We do not war after the flesh. That means that the fleshly war that's out there, the war, we're not talking about being defensive because warfare in the Bible is specifically offensive. We do not war after the flesh. Then it says in verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that it exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We do not war after the flesh. And so as Christians, we should not be involved in these wars of conquest. We should not be involved in these wars for power and money. It says in the Bible that, that, you know, that the love of money is the root of all evil. And so when you see these wars, the root is always the love of money. It's power. It's money. It's all these things that go back to it. And, and so, you know, and Winston Churchill had this in spades. And again, I could do this with any leader during World War II, but I'm specifically pointing out Winston Churchill because have you ever heard of Hillsdale College? 
I've gone to churches where they have stuff in the lobby of Hillsdale College, in their lobby, promoting it, saying, hey, you should send your kids to school here. They have an entire division of Hillsdale College that does nothing but defend Winston Churchill and the wicked, horrible things that he did. And, and you know, I, I've never seen any church fawn over any other leader out of World War II except for Winston Churchill. They're all bad, but you know what? He's worse than most. So I'm going to read from you Wikipedia, just like uh, just some really basic information, so you'll be up to date. Uh, Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill uh, was born on November 30th, 1874, and died on January 24th, 1965. He was a British state statesman, an army officer, and a writer. He was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 1940 to 1945, and those are the years of World War II. Those are the years that, that World War II was, was happening, uh, was from 1940 to 1945, and so he was in charge of England during that time. He was also the Prime Minister from 1951 to 1955, but he really didn't have any control over anything at that time. So let's, let's look at where Winston Churchill first started uh, his, you know, his life in, in politics. Actually, I'm going to start out in his, in his life in warfare. In 1897, British forces launched a bloody campaign against the Pashtun tribesmen of Afghanistan. It was there that Churchill first found his love of war. He actually quoted that in his memoirs. That's where he first found his love for war. The then 22-year-old junior cavalry lieutenant had taken part in the military action. Well there, he said, these are quotes, all who resist will be killed without quarter because the Pashtuns needed to recognize the superiority of the British race. He believed that Pashtuns needed to be dealt with and he would reminisce in his writings about how he partook in burning villages and people's homes. We proceeded, this is a quote from him, this is from his own writings. This is the stuff that's cleaned up after the fact, so you can imagine how bad it was before it was cleaned up. We proceeded to systematically, village by village, and we destroyed the houses, filled up the wells, blew down the towers, cut down the great shady trees, burned the crops, and broke the, the reservoirs in punitive devastation. This experience greatly shaped his subsequent career as a, politi as a politician. He was first elected to Parliament in 1900, where he worked his way up to Home Secretary. In 1910, he sent battalions of police from London and ordered them to attack striking miners in uh, Topandi in South Wales. One was killed and nearly 600 strikers were injured. And this kind of shows you, he really was, he didn't tolerate anything. I mean, he was not willing to, to even sit down and negotiate with anyone. He just wanted to send troops in. He became first Lord of the Admiralty in 1911, which put him in charge of the British Navy. In June of 1914, World War I started. And if you don't know what World War I is, I'm, I'm assuming that you know a little bit about history. In World War I, Germany, Austro-Hungary, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the, Turk and the, and the Turkish Empire um, were, were warring with what's called the Entente, which is Britain, France, and Russia predominantly. So, so he, he was, he was kind of relegated to, to, to second unit status because he was in charge of the British Royal Navy. The British Royal Navy really didn't have a job because the vast majority of the fighting was going on the European Peninsula. And so Winston Churchill, not to be outdone, he came up with this brilliant idea. And the brilliant idea he came up with was called the Gallipoli Campaign. And the idea was that that the Gallipoli, the Gallipoli campaign, it took place on the Gallipoli Peninsula, and it was British, French, and Russian em Empire forces. They sought to weaken the Ottoman Empire, one of the countries aligned with Germany, by taking control of the straits that provided a supply route to Russia. Now, I'm actually reading this off of this little Wikipedia Gallipoli uh, thing, but you see, this is the thing. That supply route was over 600 miles away. They didn't land there to stop the supply route. 
He landed there because he was bored and he didn't want, he wanted to be involved in the action. And so what he did is he took 250,000 troops and he landed them on the, he landed them on that peninsula that was heavily guarded by the Turks. Everyone told him not to do it. And it was a major disaster. But then he compounded that by not admitting defeat. Think about this. They landed on a beachhead. They didn't get more than a mile in. And they fought for eight months. 56,000 men died for that over eight months. And he refused to admit defeat. 132,000 were wounded on something that he just wouldn't admit defeat on. And so they finally had to fire him for him to stop the operation and bring those men home. And you know, he knew it was going to be a disaster. You know why? Because he was offered 250,000 British troops. And you know what he did? He chose Australian and New Zealand troops because he was willing to sacrifice them, but he wasn't willing to sacrifice the regular British troops. And to this day, if you go down to Australia and New Zealand, they have a much different opinion of Winston Churchill than everybody else. They hate him because he used, them, he used their men as fodder. And I mean, just the, the, the guy, if you read his dispatches the whole time, he's just, he's just saying, oh, just keep sending men. I mean, oh, 20,000 casualties, just keep doing it. 30,000 casualties, 40,000 casualties. 50,000 casualties. He doesn't care. He wants to be famous. He wants to be in charge. And this is his way of doing it because he couldn't fight the war on the mainland. You know, Winston Churchill is also the reason why America got involved in World War I. You know, between 1800 and 1899, there were 55 wars in Europe that we didn't get involved in. You know why? Because our founding fathers said, hey, you know what? Make, make, you know, trade with all, alliance with none. Do not get involved. And we didn't. We, we, would, we were like Switzerland. We just said, no, we're not going to get involved. We're not going to get involved. We're not going to get involved. But you know what? The president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, wanted to get involved. But he was two-faced. He said, he said out one side of his mouth, he's like, oh, I'm going to keep you out of the war. And then six months after he gets elected, guess what happens? We're in the war, okay? But you see, Winston Churchill had to get people, had to get America into the war because if America didn't join World War I, Britain and the Entente, the French, uh, would have lost, okay? And I mean, again, I'm not saying that the Germans are good. What I'm saying is that, is that, is that instead of negotiating, instead of trying to end a war that's killing millions of people, they're like, no, let's bring someone else into it. That's the way they think. They're implacable, okay? They won't give up. They, they just keep, I mean, they just keep taking and taking and taking. So Winston Churchill at this time, so the reason why we got into World War I and, and was the sinking of the Lusitania. And if you don't know what the Lusitania was, the Lusitania was a passenger liner ship. And this ship held over 1,000 people. And it would sail from New York to London. All right. Well, the Germans at this time, they were being blockaded by the British. And so the Germans started sinking all of the vessels that were going to Great Britain because Great Britain was sinking all the vessels that were going to Germany. It was a tit for tat thing. And so what we were doing in America is we were saying, hey, we're neutral, but we were sending Great Britain a bunch of war supplies, a bunch of ammunition, a bunch of guns and everything. And so the Germans said, you know what? We don't care if you say you're neutral because we know you're not because you're sending them ammunition. We're going to sink American vessels too. So the Lusitania, so something that was routine for the British to do especially was to mask these loads of ammunition and explosives by putting them on transport ships because they didn't think that the Germans would sink them. Or what I think is they wanted the Germans to sink them because it would bring America into the war. So the Lusitania was a supposedly neutral ship that was not armed, even though there are pictures of the Lusitania in dry dock having guns mounted to the decks, okay? They mounted guns on this ship, okay? The Lusitania was torpedoed 
when it was, uh, when it was right outside of Ireland, and over a thousand men, women, and children perished in those waters. After it was hit by the torpedo, there was a powerful secondary explosion. And that's because the Lusitania was carrying 171 tons of rifle ammunition, 1,250 cases of artillery shells, as well as 50 barrels of flammable aluminum and bronze powder. That doesn't sound like a neutral ship. That sounds like a ship that, that, was, being, that was used as a decoy or used as, as a way to get uh, ammunition in there, and they were using those people as fodder. Now, how do I know Winston Churchill was involved in that? I'll tell you, because Winston ran the Center for Co Covert Operations, and this is all documented. None of this stuff is wild-eyed conspiracy theory. You can go on Wikipedia and search this stuff. The Center for Covert Operations was run by Churchill, which was monitoring and decoding German naval radio messages. They could read the codes being sent back and forth between the German U-boats and the mainland, and they could pinpoint their position. Also, when there was a, when there was a German U-boat in the vicinity, they would send ships there, but they would also flag that area and say, hey, there's a U-boat working in these waters. Uh, you need to stay away from that. And so the Lusitania was supposed to meet in an entirely different area. But they were radioed by Churchill's staff, because he ran the Navy at the time, to meet in a totally different location. And the two ships that were supposed to escort it in were sent somewhere else. The Lusitania was put off the coast of Ireland within 10 miles of where they knew U-boat number 20 was. They knew it was there. They wanted it to get sunk, and it did. And the outcry was huge. You know, I mean, the people in America said, hey, you're just, you, you just destroyed this ship full of men, women, and children. They didn't tell them that ship was armed. We didn't find that out until literally, I think it was 1995 that they dived on that ship, and they said, oh, guess what? It's full of munitions. So the Germans actually did do that. And you know what? The German embassy at the time... They, they knew that the Lusitania was, was uh, going with guns and ammunition. Now, these U-boats, when they went out, they would send them out for a year at a time, and they would have almost no radio communication with, with the German mainland. And so they were just told, hey, if you see an American flag and it's armed, shoot it. If you see a British flag and it's armed, shoot it. All right? That's what they were told to do because that's what the British were doing to them. So it was tit for tat. And so because of this, the, the German uh, um, embassy was afraid that the Lusitania was going to be sunk. So what they did is they paid for an advertisement in over 260 newspapers warning people, do not board the Lusitania. It might get destroyed because it is carrying guns and ammunition, and we know it is. And that was published in exactly two newspapers because it was squashed by our government. The Cincinnati Star, which ran that, Woodrow Wilson put the editor of that in a mental institution to try and get him to stop publishing warnings to people who were getting on board ships. I mean, all this is documented. This is not speculation at all. You can literally Wikipedia the stuff that I'm telling you about, and it'll show up with government documentation. That's because they don't care now. It's over 100 years later. They don't care. They don't care if you pull up their dirty laundry. Go to Proverbs chapter 1. You see, what Great Britain had done, what Churchill had done specifically, is that he had gotten us involved in a war we, that we didn't want. Woodrow Wilson wanted to be at war, but you know, the American people didn't. We wanted to be neutral. We didn't want to go over, like I said, there were 55 wars fought in Europe the previous 100 years, and we didn't get involved in any of them because we didn't want to be involved in their stupid wars because they're always fighting about something. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10, it says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lay in wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up, alive as the grave, the whole, and whole as, as that that go down to the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in, in the way with them. 
refrain thy foot from their path. You see, what they really did is they enticed us into going to war with them. Okay? And, and what did they promise? They promised us that we, would, that we would gain. They promised us that we'd be making the world safe for democracy, whatever that even means. I mean, but really, what was the fruit of it? What did they really want? The New World Order? They want, that's what they wanted to usher in as far back as World War I. All right? And, but we didn't want to be involved, and so what they did is they set us up so that, so that through our rage, because they're lying to us, we would get involved. In 1921... After World War I, oh, excuse me, no, uh, uh, during the fight of the Irish in independence between 1918 and 1923, Churchill was one of few British officials in favor of bombing Irish protesters. This is in their own country. Bombing Irish protesters from the air and suggested using machine guns and firebombs to scatter them. As Secretary of State for the colonies, he followed through on that threat in Iraq. In 1921, he formed the Middle East Department, which was responsible for Iraq. Determined to have his beloved empire on the cheap, he decided air power could replace ground troops. A strategy of bombing any resistance to British rule was now employed. Several times in the 1920s, various groups in the region known as Iraq rose up against the British, and the Air Force was then put into action, indiscriminately bombing civilian areas so to subdue the population. Churchill was also an advocate for the use of mustard and poison gases. While Secretary of War, he advised that the provision of some kind of anthrax bombs should be used for use primarily uh, in operations against the, the turbulent tribes in order to take control of Iraq. You know, if you don't know what an anthrax bomb is, anthrax is a deadly disease, okay? Uh, if, uh, if you're a farmer and you hear about anthrax, you start freaking out because that means your entire, all your cattle are going to die, all your sheep are going to die. And the British were, were pioneering this technology in the 1920s and 30s. And, you know, they actually did drop an anthrax bomb. They dropped it on an island off the coast of Scotland. You still can't go to that island this, today or you'll die of anthrax. They had tens of thousands of these things that they wanted to drop. And I mean, I'm going to get to this later because he brings up anthrax during World War II, and it's bad. You know, mercifully, between 1929 and 1939, Churchill's political career was interrupted as his party lost political power. But on September 1st of 1939, Germany and Russia invaded Poland. One month after the invasion, Poland surrendered. And you see, something that you have to understand here about Germany is that Germany, after World War I, Germany had a lot of territory taken away from it. A lot of territory that was traditionally German was taken away from them, and a lot of that territory was actually formed into brand new countries that had never existed before. And so one of the things that Hitler did is that he promoted a concept of what's called breathing room, where he basically said, hey, I want to, I want to get all that land back that we lost during World War I. And one of the areas was about half of Poland. Now, Poland had signed a peace treaty with Great Britain. And it basically said that if anyone attacks Poland, Great Britain's on the hook to, to uh, be at war with them. And so Germany attacked Poland. And I don't even really want to call it an attack. I mean, it lasted a month. There were very few casualties. But you see, here's the kicker. They attacked, Germany and Russia attacked it at the same time. They met up in the middle, they split it down the middle as a country, and Russia took their old land back that used to be part of Poland, and Germany took their old land back that used to be part of Germany. I mean, the areas where the Germans actually went into was predominantly German-speaking, okay? This is, and, and what blows me away was that this is what really instigated World War II, you know? And, and I mean, millions of people died at this. So, not, not in the Polish invasion, but as subsequent. So, get this. September 1st, they invade. Britain had a treaty with Poland, so they declared war, but they only declared war on Germany. They didn't declare war on Russia. Well, wait a minute. I thought they were supposed to declare war on anyone who declared war on Poland. Well, this is the first of some questionable moments that you'll be, that you'll be scratching your head about in this sermon. Okay, because they never declared war on Russia. As a matter of fact, Russia was their ally. So were they really so concerned about Poland? No, they weren't. They weren't concerned about Poland. 
They were concerned about their own empire. So Britain sent over half a million troops to France to prepare for an invasion of Germany, even though the war with Poland was over. So the war with Poland's over, okay? This is known as, as the, the, the silent war because months and months and months and months went by and no one's attacking. There's nothing going on. This is a time where you could make peace, where you could stop a catastrophic war, but they refused to do it. And then everyone's like, well, wait a minute, Germany invaded France. Did they? Is that what you learned in school? That Germany invaded France? Wow, that's interesting. Because you see, France launched a brief and ineffective invasion of Germany in September of 1939. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, Germany didn't attack France until May 10th of 1940. So who attacked who first? France yep. went in to Germany yep. and the Germans attacked the French. Yep. Why? Because half a million British troops are being built up on their border. You've got seven million French soldiers on the border. They've already attacked. Now it's the winter time. Oh, guess what's gonna happen? They're gonna attack in the spring because this is what they do because France already declared war on Germany. Now, at this time, Germany is actually trying to make some sort of peace treaty. They're extending their arm, you know, saying, hey, maybe we can come to an agreement here. Maybe you guys can give us back the land that you took after World War I, and this will all go away, okay? And this is documented. This is, I mean, time and time again, okay? But, of course, Great Britain didn't want that, and neither did France. At this time, France was falling apart. France was being torn apart by socialists and communists and fascists, okay? And you had these groups that were tearing the French government apart. It was not a unified uh, country, you know? And, and so people have this concept that, oh, the Germans just went into France and, and you know, they invaded France and they're all bad and, and you, know, you know, England's all good and America's all good. And, and no, everyone's bad in this situation, <laughs> all right? Everybody. But what happened, what Germany really did, you know, in anticipation of the spring invasion by both England and France on May 10th, 1940, Germany invaded France through Belgium. Because you can't invade France unless you actually go through Belgium. So they invaded Belgium. Um, and I mean, I'm not excusing the Germans. I'm telling you this is why they did it, okay? And people could have stopped this, but they refused to because they wanted a war. The Germans routed the British and French, and the French surrendered June 25th of 1914. That's six weeks. What Germany couldn't do in four years during World War I, they did in six weeks in World War II. France was utterly destroyed. And you know why France was utterly destroyed? Because it was already in turmoil. Because there was already factions in the government that had torn France apart. It is said that if World War II hadn't happened, France would have had a civil war because that's where they were headed. And so what Hitler did when he invaded France is he took over the top part of France and he gave the southern part of France to a French politician named Vichy to control, okay? So it's not like Hitler just went in and took everything over. He didn't want to. I mean, you know, when they went into France, they wanted the area that they had already lost during World War I, but they gained the whole country. You know, it's, it's actually almost the exact same thing that happened to us in Mexico. But um, I'll preach about that at some point. Um, so, so you see, this is where the war should have ended, all right? Because at this point, Hitler is basically giving them, uh, you know, Hitler is basically saying, hey, you're defeated, you're cut off and surrounded, let's, Let's, let's end this peaceably. I do not want to have a war with you guys. I just want my land. I just want the land that we had back. These people spoke German in these lands, okay? I mean, in, in these areas of France, the predominant language was German because it was taken away 30 years before. So the British Expeditionary Force, which was cut off and surrounded at Dunkirk, you probably heard about that, and could have been destroyed by Hitler, Instead, Hitler led over 500,000 British troops evacuate. So this is what I've always been told. Oh, well, Hitler was a moron. Yeah, he, he cut off and surrounded the British troops and he could have finished them off, but he was so incompetent he didn't do that. No, he wanted them to leave. He wanted them to escape because he didn't want to fight a war with Great Britain. 
He wanted to end it peaceably, and so he let them go. He could have. He could have completely destroyed half a million British soldiers. They had no equipment. They threw their guns behind them. They, they didn't have anything. But the Germans were ordered by Hitler. You can actually go in. You, okay, so the British decoded the, all of the German uh, communications in 1940. They were literally reading everything that the Germans were putting out. All right? They knew what Hitler was going to do before his generals did. And Hitler would send communiques to his generals. Do not attack British forces. Let them escape. Do not attack British forces. And his generals sent letters back to him. Please let us attack them. They're wide open. We can wipe them out. Do not attack them. I do not want war with Britain. You can go to the archives in Great Britain. You can go to the archives in, in, uh, in Germany. And you can literally read these. Okay, and they, they say he says it over and over and over again. And this isn't propaganda after the war. These are actual communiques that are authorized, and you can go online and read them. Okay, but you see, historians don't do this. You know how historians write histories? They get a history book that's authorized and signed and sealed by the government, and then what they do is they quote that history book. And then, and then another guy comes along and he's like, hey, I want to write a history about World War II. And he reads all these other history books. And he starts, and then he references all those. And then you have this guy over here. He writes a history book and he references all these guys. So what they do is they sit around in their, in their book line caves, reading history books, quoting each other, and none of them go back to the original sources. Because first off, did you know that not one person who has ever written a book about the history of World War II in the English language, except for one guy that I can find actually knew how to speak, read, and write German. How can you write a history of what happened during World War II if you can't even read German communications? What you're doing is you're relying on other sources. You're relying on government sources. And, and you know, that's where you get all this fallacy. Because you see, the victors write the history. So we're in Dunkirk. 500,000 British soldiers are evacuated to England. And, he sent a, and then Hitler sent a generous offer of peace to Churchill. At this point, England could have accepted the treaty and saved tens of millions of lives. Go to, uh, go to James chapter 3. Go to James chapter 3. Can I get a cup of water? I'm going to read Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes 3, 8 says, There's a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. In James chapter 3, verse 18, it says, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. But, you know, Churchill knew that as soon as the war was over, he would lose his political power. So just like in World War I, he did everything he could to get America into the war. In Romans chapter 14, verse 19, thank you, says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify one another. The Bible over and over again emphasizes making peace. Churchill, though, couldn't make peace. He couldn't make peace because he would lose his political power. He would be in the wilderness. I mean, he even talked about it. He said in his memoirs that the war could not end because he would lose his power. Meanwhile, by June 10th of 1914, the French army was shattered. But the French navy was amazingly intact. Francos Darlan, the admiral of the French fleet, told, told Churchill point blank that the fleet would be sunk before it was surrendered to the Germans. You know, this man told Churchill, he said, hey, don't worry about it. We're going to sink the fleet if the Germans try and take it over. And he told all of his commanders that if any Germans came near the fleet to sail to America, th these were orders that he told Churchill over and over again. But you see, I think that Churchill actually mi ended up misinterpreting because Churchill thought that he was a great interpreter and so he would actually take all these communiques directly in the language that they were sent in. And so I believe that he actually messed up in his translation and that's why he did this. So 
he actually ordered the British fleet to attack the French fleet. They were in harbor. They hadn't done anything. The Germans were hundreds of miles away, and the commander of French forces literally sent a letter to the head of the British fleet that was there that said, if German forces come within 10 miles of our ships, we're going to sail to America. But Churchill said, no, attack them. The British fleet attacked, and in less than 10 minutes, 1,297 French soldiers were dead, and three capital ships, along with one destroyer, were damaged or destroyed. In July of 1940, Hitler's peace offer was refused, and England was blockading German ports. As an answer to this, German submarines started sinking military and supply ships to the island nation. The, bomb, uh, the bombing and bombing communication and radar stations on the coast of the country. But Hitler had strict orders for his air force not to, to bomb only military targets and not to bomb cities. Again, these are communications that you can read. You can see where he's saying, do not bomb British cities, period. Now, you know, one of the things that, that always used to kind of gall me, because I've, I've always been a historian, and I've always read history. I, I was fascinated by World War II. And, and something I always found really stupid that the Germans did was all their bombers. He's like, when we make bombers, we make like the B-17s and the B-24s, and they're these massive bombers that hold thousands and thousands of pounds of bombs, and the bomb bay door just opens, and they just fall where they're going to go, right? So the Germans actually said, no, every single bomber that we have must be a dive bomber. And I always thought, well, that limits you so much. You can't carry very many bombs. But then I found out why. The reason why was that before World War II, indiscriminate carpet bombing was considered a crime all throughout the world. Okay? But the Germans said, we will not carpet bomb cities. What we're going to do is we're going to have dive bombers that can precisely bomb areas that are military targets or like an ammunition factory. And I mean, they even talk about it in their communications. They say it would be better for us to pinpoint with a 500 pound bomb uh, with a dive bomber, an ammunition factory, than to carpet bomb uh, an entire city and hopefully burn it. Okay? They were much more concerned about that because they weren't barbarians. Okay? And I always thought that they were stupid. I'm like, why didn't they just make big bombers to bomb cities like we did? Well, they thought it was abhorrent. Yeah. You know? And it's like, good on them, man. Yeah. I mean, but, but you see, that's not what you learn in school. You learn in school that, oh, they were stupid. Hitler was dumb. Yeah. You know, they should have done this. They should have done that. Well, you know what? Maybe we're, we were doing the bad stuff. By May of 1926, uh, uh, excuse me, by May 26th of 1940, the British had broken the German Enigma codes, so they were able to read all their radio traffic. They were able to read every single communication that Hitler sent to his generals, and every single communication that sent back. And you know what really strikes me is that it actually took them so long to win that war. They literally knew what was going to happen before Hitler's generals did. That's how incompetent they were. Think about that. It just, it just blows me away that, that, they, that even though they knew where they were going, they, they still, oh, it took us four years. So Bletchley Park was where they actually figured out how to break these codes. And, and there, now Bletchley Park was a, was a private, uh, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a top secret installation. And this just kind of gets to the character of, of what the British were doing at this time. So the British... In, they had a secret service, right, which was doing all these behind-the-scenes things. And they were doing some really reprehensible things. And one of the things that they did specifically was that when they would bring people in, they would usually pick people that had skeletons in their closet. And so one of the most common things they did were bring in homosexuals to do a lot of the work at these, at these areas. So there's actually a very famous guy at Bletchley Park who came up with the first computer system to decode the Enigma machine. And the LGBTQ, XYZ, whatever community, they, they hold this guy up. Oh, he's so great. He's so fantastic. Well, any mathematician could have done what he did. The reason why they picked him is because they knew they could blackmail him. They knew that he wouldn't speak to anyone because they'd bring out his string of boyfriends. You know? And I mean, they loved him so much that after the war in 1951, they had him chemically sterilized. 
I mean, but th this is the type of people that they go after. And this is all throughout the British Secret Service. I mean, everyone's heard of James Bond, right? You know, well, James Bond was written by a man named Ian Fleming. And Ian Fleming was actually in charge of the British Secret Service in France. And you know who he predominantly employed? Homos. He wanted them because he knew that they could keep a secret. He knew he would have something to hold over them. And that's why he makes James Bond so over the top, you know, a ladies' man. Because he was, he, he was in an interview, someone asked him, well, why do you make him an over the top ladies' man? And he said, well, because I've only met two kinds of spies. Over the top ladies' men or fags. So I, and I didn't want to make him a fag. I mean, that's, I'm literally quoting what he said. So, so they were using people who were reprobates to do this stuff. They, to, to get intelligence, to do horrible, wicked things, and to come up with uh, information on, on Germany and their allies. So that's the mindset. Now, and, and I also want to point something else out, is that in Germany, there was actually an entire organization that was called the Ministry Against Abortion and Homosexuality. And they actually went through finding specifically people who were homosexuals and making sure that abortions were not done. And I mean, you know, like I said, I'm not excusing Germany, but I'm going to point it out when they're, pro when they're doing something good. Okay, and you know what? Burning books that were smut and pornography and child pornography, which is what everyone sees that photo of Hitler burning books. But if you actually read the books that he's burning, most of them were child porn. I'm serious. Berlin had turned into the cesspool of the world in the Weimar Republic. Child pornography was rampant. I mean, it, it, was, it was so disgusting, it was known as the child pornography capital of the world, bestiality capital of the world, necrophilia capital of the world. And again, this is stuff you can Wikipedia. It's not hard to find. I mean, this is the, the movies that were coming out of, of Berlin at that time in the 1920s before Hitler took power started the American censor board because they were so disgusted by the stuff coming out, okay? They didn't want to see that smut. And that's what, that's what predominantly Hitler was getting rid of. Now again, I'm not excusing Hitler, but I am going to point out areas where he did something that I agree with. And I agree with getting rid of pornography and smut and child porn and stopping child pornography and outlawing homosexuality and outlawing abortion. Those things I agree with. Okay? So I just wanted to give you that mindset because it kind of shows you how the British were working at the time. You know, Churchill is the head of the British government. Everything goes through him. Churchill was convinced that if he could get Germany to start bombing British cities, then America would enter the war. At this point, large-scale carpet bombing by civilians was considered criminal. Everyone was disgusted by it. So on August 25th, 1940, Churchill sent 100 bombers with incendiary bombs to bomb the suburbs of Berlin. He did this seven times. And on September 4th, 1940, Hitler in a speech said that if the British did it one more time, he would burn London to the ground. That night, Churchill launched another raid. U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt, at the time, he wanted to go to war. He wanted to go to war badly. He had private correspondence with Churchill that has now been made available where he says, hey, I need a reason to go to war with Germany, but I don't have one. I can't convince people to do it because they were still burned by World War I. So time and time again, uh, I, I mean, the, if you look at the movies that were being made in the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s, uh, they, they were gearing them all towards trying to get America into the war. The Lend-Lease program was going, I mean, you know, what's the difference between fighting a war with someone and giving them all the supplies they need to fight the war? That's what we were doing through the Lend-Lease program. We were already involved. The Germans knew we were involved and that's why they started sinking our ships, okay? Just like in World War I, all right? It's not, you know, Churchill actually holds the dubious distinction of bringing us into a war twice, okay? Because he helped engineer a lot of this stuff. One of the things he engineered was he engineered the blockading of Japan. Japan was an island nation that 
anywhere from 60 to 80%, depending on the commodities you're looking at, of the commodities that they used to run their entire nation were imported. And Great Britain was blockading Japan. They had, the, and, and I mean, Japan was fighting a war in China, and you know, yeah, they were doing some bad things, but you know what? You don't counter them murdering people by murdering people. I mean, they're basically, they're basically poking them. They're basically setting up bases in their backyard, saying, hey, we're going to blockade you. We're not going to let anything get in. Poke, 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 poke. And then when they actually do strike, everyone's surprised. Oh, they attacked us. Well, yeah, really. Like, you couldn't see that coming. Yeah. Okay. So, so and they, they attacked a military outpost. I mean, Hawaii wasn't even a state, you know? And they, they attacked a military outpost. And you know what? FDR knew about it. The British knew about it before it happened. And... And they let it happen because they wanted to go to war. That's what it is. I mean, come on. All the ships that were really critical, the aircraft carriers, oh, they just happened to be all moved to a different area. Even though that never happened before because they never wanted to put aircraft carriers together because it was too tempting of a target. They were like, oh, we'll just leave these lesser ships here and we're going to move all of our important ships out here. Yeah, we don't know anything about what's going on. No, they did. They had already broken the Japanese code. They broke the Japanese purple code. They knew it. They got, they got advanced intelligence that told them that the Japanese were planning an attack on Pearl Harbor within the week that it happened. Okay? It's not that hard to figure out. But so after that, we entered the war. All right? And at this time, you know, Germany is already, for all intents and purposes, already at war with us because they're, they're already we're already supplying Great Britain with all the supplies that they need to fight the war. You know, US, uh, we actually pulled the, we, we gave Roosevelt what he needed to convince the, or excuse me, we, the British people gave Roosevelt, or excuse me, Winston Churchill gave uh, Roosevelt what he needed to, to get us in, into the war. Uh, in a radio broadcast of, of, um, October 27th of 1941, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said this. He said, Hitler has often protested that his plans for conquest do not extend across the Atlantic Ocean. I have in my possession a secret map made in Germany by Hitler's government, by the planners of the New World Order. It is a map of South America and a part of Central America as Hitler proposes to recognize it. You know, and, and this is what he says he was revealed by the British government. That was written, on, that was written by the British government. That map, the, the British admitted that they made that map. They actually not only made it up, but they actually made up all this communications that said that Hitler was going to invade South America. I mean, that particular map is in the FDR library. And there's a little plaque underneath that says this was made by the British Secret Service. Okay. It was a lie to get us into the war. Hitler did, yeah, Hitler's going to pick up and attack someone across the Atlantic, right, in, in the 1940s. You're nuts. I mean, Hitler didn't even have a navy at that time. It would have been impossible. You know, just like, just like, um, you know, just like Churchill, you know, I want to bring this up too, you know, when people think about Churchill, they usually think about the radio broadcast, you know. You know, where, where Churchill's got that, you know, weird voice and he's saying, we shall meet them on the beaches and on the land. And I mean, we're never going to give up, you know. And you hear those speeches, right? Those radio speeches. You know, Hitler was a drunk. Oh, excuse me, not Hitler. Churchill was a drunk. All of, his, all of his commanders said he was a drunk. Time and time again, you read their diaries and they're saying, oh, Hitler came in. Oh, Hitler, excuse me. Churchill came in to plan all this stuff. And he was drunk. He was falling down drunk. He was half tight, whatever. You can read these guys saying it, but then when you actually look in the official correspondence, they change it from tight to tired. He was very tired. You're right. Yeah, that, they're just whitewashing it. He was a falling down drunk. As a matter of fact, all those speeches that you heard on the radio, that you heard when you were a kid listening to some World War II documentary, those were actually done by a guy named Norman Shelley. Because those, were, those, were, those speeches were done at night, and Churchill was so falling down drunk every night that he couldn't actually do those speeches. It was done by a guy who was a voice impersonator. 
And that's not, just look him up. You can go to Wikipedia, type in Norman Shelley, and it gives you a list of all the speeches that he did, every single famous speech that Churchill supposedly did. I'm sure he wrote them. He was a great writer. But they were voiced by this guy because Churchill was so slobbering drunk by the evening, every evening. And the reason why I point that out is that he was drunk during the vast majority of these meetings where he would decide the fate of millions of people. And everyone said it. Everyone would, I mean, you had, you had the Prime Minister of Canada saying that he's a drunken fool. You had the Prime Minister of, of, uh, of um, uh, Australia saying that he was drunk all the time he was visiting. I mean, Churchill drank and drank and drank. And when you're making these decisions, go, go ahead and turn to, uh, go ahead and turn to Isaiah uh, chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Let's get some Bible in here. Go to Isaiah chapter 28 and look at verse 7. But they have also erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink and are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. You know, he stumbled in judgment and it cost thousands of lives. I'm not even, I'm not even halfway in this. Okay, I had to cut three quarters of this sermon out of all the stuff that he did. I'm basically just giving you all the points where his actions killed more than 10,000 people. I'm not even going after the small ones. I'm going after the big ones. And there are a lot of them. Okay? So, again, the U-boats uh, during World War II is the same thing he did during World War I. Okay? They knew the codes. They knew exactly where all the U-boats were, and they would send American shipping towards those U-boats so they would sink, and then we would be brought into the war. They did that on purpose, time and time again. You know, also in, in 1943, he presided over something absolutely despicable. You know, India was a, was a British colony at this time. You know, very few Britons actually know about the genocide in Bengal let alone how Churchill engineered it. Churchill's hatred for Indians, for dot, not feather, um, for Indians led to four million Indians starving to death during the Bengal famine of 1943. This is, this is a, these are quotes from him. I hate Indians. They are beastly people with a beastly religion. Bengal had better than normal harvest during the, Brit, during the British enforced famine. The British... Uh, the British Army took millions of tons of rice from starving people to ship to the Middle East where it wasn't even needed. When the starving people of Bengal asked for food, Churchill said the famine was their own fault, for they breeded like rabbits. Churchill refused all the offers to send aid to Bengal. Canada offered 10,000 tons of rice, and the U.S. offered 100,000 100, tons of wheat but he just point blank refused to allow it. He said that they didn't have enough room for the shipping. So he let 4 million people starve to death. I mean, like I said, I'm giving you stuff where a lot of people died. There are a lot of the years in, in between where it's only 1,000 people here and 800 people there and 5,000 people here. Well, no, here's 4 million. And it's what he did specifically. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19. I am about two-thirds done. I'm not going to say I'm only half done. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 9, it says, If thou shalt keep all these commandments to do them, which I command thee this day, to love the Lord thy God, and to walk ever in his ways, then shalt thou add three cities more for thee besides these three. That innocent blood be not shed in thy land, which the Lord God giveth thee for an inheritance, and, show, and so blood be upon thee. God hates shedding of innocent blood. He hates it. It's an abomination. Hands that shed innocent blood. Violent people. You know, God hates that. And you know, when Winston Churchill appointed Butcher Bomber Harris... Excuse me. No, not Butcher. No. Well, yeah, he was the Butcher, Bomber Harris. But a, a man named Harris, who got a knighthood and all this other stuff, as first air marshal, 
He was in charge of planning and executing all the raids on France and Germany during the war. This is a quote from him. Now, you might not be familiar with the word Bosch, but Bosch is a British slang term for Germans, okay? This is what he said in his own memoirs, this, this, this Harris guy who he put in charge of bombing. What we want to do in addition to the horrors of fire is to bring the masonry crashing down upon the Bosch, to kill the Bosch and to terrify the Bosch. The entire plan that they had for bombing had nothing to do with military targets. It had to do with demoralizing their entire population and murdering as many people as they could. Between 1940 and 1945, 61 German cities with a total population of 25 million were destroyed or devastated in a bombing campaign initiated by the British government. Destruction on this scale had no other purpose, uh, purpose than indiscriminate mass murder of as many German people as possible, quite regardless of the, their civilian status. It led to regulatory bombing resulting in 60,000 British dead, or excuse me, retaliatory bombing. So because they did this, the Germans started retaliatorily bombing the British. And 60,000 British died and 86,000 were injured. The British and the U.S. also bombed France, resulting in 60,000 civilians dead. So that's just in France, okay? We're going to get to some of the numbers that happened in Germany because they're just staggering. But I want to give you, I, I want to give you some quotes of people who were actually there, okay? So J.M. Spate, who is the principal secretary of the Air Ministry, so he is this guy's secretary, okay? In 1940. This is a quote from him. In 1940, Churchill believed uh, that bombing held the, uh, the secret to victory. He was convinced that raids of sufficient intensity could destroy German morale. And so his war cabinet planned a campaign that abandoned the accepted practice of attacking enemy's armed forces and instead made civilians the primary target. Night after night, RAF bombers, that's the Royal Air Force, in ever-increasing numbers struck through Germany, usually at working-class housing because it was more densely packed. This is a quote. The attack on the Ruhr was therefore an informal invasion to the Luftwaffe to bomb London. The primary purpose of these raids was to goad the German into undertaking reprisal raids of a similar character in Berlin. Such raids would arouse intense indignation in Britain against Germany and so create a war psychosis without which it would be impossible to carry on modern war. This is a quote from the principal secretary of the air ministry. Okay, this isn't some fringe guy. This is a guy who's literally working in Churchill's cabinet. Okay, in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, it says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. That's an abomination to the Lord. They specifically went after innocent blood. That's what they wanted to do. This is, this is also one of the air secretaries, Sir Archibald Sinclair. It sounds so regal. I am in full agreement with terror bombing. I am all for the bombing of working class areas of German cities. I am a Cromwellian and believe in slain in the name of the Lord. They did this. They, they did this in some sick and twisted way in the name of the Lord. You know, the Germans did too. On that belt buckle, the, the death's head, the German death's head, it actually, the belt buckle says, God be with us or something like that. I mean, you know, and Hitler wasn't a Christian. Hitler was a reprobate just like all of them, you know. But these are the people that are running the bombing campaign in Great Britain, all right? They knew what they were doing. They were out to murder people. The British air chief argued that the, that the desired result of reducing German industrial production would be more readily achieved if homes of workers in factories were destroyed so the workers could be kept busy arranging for the burial of their wives and children. Output might reasonably be expected to fall. It was concentrated on working class houses. That's a report that was written during the war. That's what they wanted to do. All German towns and cities above 50,000 population were from 50 to 80 percent destroyed. Hamburg was totally destroyed. 70,000 civilians died, and Cologne likewise turned into a moonscape. As Hamburg burned, the winds feeding the three-mile-high flames reached twice the hurricane speed and exceeded 150 miles per hour. 
Trees three feet in diameter on the outskirts of the city were sucked out of the ground by, by what seemed to be supernatural forces and hurled miles uh, into the city inferno, as were vehicles, men, women, and children. One of the worst massacres in the history of the world was the devastation on, of Dresden in February 13th of 1945. This was three months before Germany surrendered, okay? At this point in the war, everyone knew the war was coming to an end. Everyone said, hey, it's going to happen soon, and it did. Three months later, the Germans capitulated. So when the British decided to firebomb Dresden, a city of over a million people that had just received almost 600,000 refugees fleeing from the Russian army, uh, Dresden's, and, and you know, their justification for this was that Dresden was producing war materials. Well, I looked this up. I looked up what Dresden was producing. And their two largest contributions to the wartime manufacturing were the Carl Zeiss binocular factory and the largest German cigarette factory. Tell me what that has to do with war material. You know what, before the war, what, before the war, Dresden was known as the art capital of Europe. It was known for cathedrals, it was known for paintings, it was known for art shows. That's how they made their living. And you know, this is the thing that just blows me away, all right? You see, the Germans were convinced that they would never bomb Dresden, but they were bombing everywhere else. And so the Germans, the ones that could afford it, started sending their children to Dresden by the thousands, trainloads of children escaping from Berlin and Dusseldorf so they wouldn't be bombed. And we knew about it. We knew about it every day because we had POWs. In that. We had 26,000 American and British POWs in Dresden that were working there in the local, in the post office and in the train yard, okay? And the only, the only legitimate military target that they could possibly say would be the train yard. When they bombed Dresden, the train yard wasn't touched because they didn't care about the train yard. They cared about murdering 100, uh, over 100,000 people. I'm gonna go into that. People were so convinced Dresden would never be bombed because it had no strategic importance that they sent their children there for safety. On February 13th of 1945, Churchill sent 200 Lancaster bombers containing 1,477 tons of explosives and 1,100 tons of firebombs to bomb Dresden. They started bombing that night at 10 p.m. The Germans, believing the city would never be bombed, had removed all anti-aircraft. And there was no bomb protection in the city. But this was just the first pass. Three hours later, 500 Lancaster bombers repeated the bombing just in time to catch all the emergency crews as they were trying to pull people from the rubble. One bomber fleet captain said that at 2,000 feet, he could fill in the logbook from the light of the fires burning in Dresden. The fires could be seen from over 150 miles away. So that at 10 p.m., they initially dropped bombs and then at 1 p.m., they drop more bombs. The next, uh, they drop more bombs. And then again, at 1 p.m., the next day, so three times, over 200 American B-17s dropped 1,350 tons of explosives on the burning city. I've seen pictures, and it staggers your imagination. The fire, the fire was so intense, eyewitnesses said it sucked people into the flames. That night, over 125,000 people burned to death, with large numbers being women and children, because Dresden was seen as a safe haven. Dresden was of no strategic importance, and the bombing of the city didn't change anything in the war. Everyone knew it was going to end. An official British source <clears throat> This is what Churchill said about the history books. History, Churchill himself said, will judge me kindly because I intend to write it myself. He did. 
penning a multi-volume history of World War II, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize for literature for his self-serving fiction. In a secret wartime memorandum, Winston Churchill, so this is after that. No, this, actually, excuse me, this is before that. But I wanted to end on this. In a secret wartime memorandum, Winston Churchill told his advisors that he wanted to drench Germany with poison gas. Churchill's July 1944 memo to his chief of staff, General Hastings, Ismay, was, re was reproduced in the August-September 1985 issue of American Heritage Magazine. This is not disputed at all. Everyone knows this happened. I want you to think very seriously over the question of poison gas, the four-page note began. Britain's wartime leader continued, it is absurd to consider morality as a topic when everyone used gas in the last war without word of complaint from moralists or the church. On the other hand, in the last war, the bombing of open cities was regarded as forbidden. Now everyone does it as a matter of course. It is simply a question of fashion, changing as she does, uh, simply a fashion as women change between a long and short skirt. Churchill's, blunt, Churchill's directive bluntly stated, I want a cold-blooded, calculated uh, plan to use poison gas. One really must not be bound within silly conventions of the mind, whether they be those that rule in the last war or those in, in reverse which rule in this. Specifically, he proposed, we could drench the cities of the Ruhr and many other cities in Germany in such a way that most of the population would be required constant medical attention. It may be several weeks or even months before I shall ask you to drench Germany with poison gas, and if we do, let us do it with 100%. In the meantime, I want the matter studied in cold-blooded, sensible, in a cold-blooded and sensible matter, and not by the particular set of psalm-singing, uninformed defeatists, which one run across, run across now, here, now, now there. Yeah, this guy's, he's definitely drunk when he wrote this. Churchill proposed, what Churchill proposed would have meant violating the 1925 Geneva Protocol outlawing the use of poison gas was never and was never adopted. His military advisor argued that gas warfare would divert allies, allied warplanes from more effective strategy of bombing. Germany's industries and cities, of German industries and cities, gas attacks would not be decisive they feared, and Germany would probably retaliate with devastating effect against Britain. Churchill complained to, the, to, to an associate that he was not at all convinced by the negative report, but, but reluctantly gave in. Clearly, I cannot make head against the Parsons and the warriors as, at the same time, he complained in private. You know, he also said that if he would have written that order a month earlier, then the, then the guys who opposed it wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have been able to oppose it. And, you know, he also wanted to drop anthrax bombs. Now, poison gas, this is another quote from me, he says, I'm strongly in favor of using poison gas against the uncivilized tribes. It would spread a lively terror. He's actually talking about that to some other tribesmen. But Churchill wanted to drop poison gas on Germany. Now, Hitler had actually been gassed during World War I, and he was very stigmatized by that. And he said over and over again, he would send memos, do not use poison gas. They must use it first. We will not start a poison gas war. The poison gas that we had, that, that Great Britain had at the time, was the same poison gas that they had during World War I, which was fairly ineffective against any kind of gas mass. The gas that the Germans had were neurotoxins, sarin gas. This gas, one drop of this gas can kill over 100 people. The Germans had 30,000 sarin gas bombs that they never used because we didn't gas them. But if we had, they would have blanket gassed all of our troops that were there and the outcome of the war would have been changed. And that leads me to another question. If Hitler's such a mass murdering lunatic that he's willing to do absolutely anything, 
Why didn't he use those 30,000 pounds of sarin gas or 30,000 sarin gas bombs? Because he didn't want to. Because this is the thing about history. It, it makes people that are, yeah, it, it turns everyone into extremes. It makes Churchill into this righteous man and it makes Hitler into Satan. When really, you know what? They're both pretty bad. My point is, is that what Winston Churchill almost did would have lost the war and would have killed even millions of more people. But thankfully, he wasn't able to do it. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 25, 27. Deuteronomy chapter 27. Deuteronomy chapter 27, look at verse 25. Verse 25 says, Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person, and all the people shall say, Amen. You know, what we're really doing is we're trying to take reward from slaying people. Because what happened after the war? The UN started. All these terrible things started. I mean, you know, Winston Churchill was a bigoted, racist man that fanned the flames of war in his own, for his own power and prestige. He's a mass murderer on a scale that rivals Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong. He was not a religious leader or a preacher, but he is revered in most churches today and was instrumental in the establishment and, uh, the establishment and furtherance of Zionism and the state of Israel. Churchill was even willing to sacrifice his own countrymen just to keep his own political power. He was responsible for the murder of millions of Germans, Indians, Europeans, and Africans. As a Bible-believing Christian, we should always strive to live peaceably with all men, not to worship, extol, and quote a mass-murdering warmonger. You know, even though I titled this sermon, Winston Churchill's Burning in Hell, the main sacred cow that I want to slay is World War II. World War II was an unjust war fought by unjust men, and you should not be extolling those men, especially from the pulpit. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for this opportunity to preach. I pray that this edified your church, Lord, and I pray that we wouldn't be fooled. We wouldn't be fooled into getting involved in these wars that have nothing to do with us. I mean, the apostles didn't storm the beaches of Rome trying to fight for Israel. What did they do? They won people to the Lord. They got people saved, and that's what we need to do. We need to get people saved because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Thank you, Lord, so much for giving us this country which we can freely speak about these things because a lot of what I've preached today in a lot of these other countries in Europe, I'd be in jail. But we live in a nation, Lord, that allows us the freedom to speak this, and I do thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.